Welcome everyone to the 2016 APS CDC IDSA Clinical Practice Guidelines Treatment of Drug Susceptible Tuberculosis webinar. I'm Kelly Musoke, the Director of Education at the Curry International TB Center. We have over 900 participants that registered for today's webinar from across the United States and we know that many of you are viewing in group. This webinar is jointly sponsored by the Southeastern National Tuberculosis Center, the Curry International TB Center at UCSF, the Rutgers Global Tuberculosis Institute, the Heartland National Tuberculosis Center, and the Mayo Clinic Center for Tuberculosis. We always like to ensure that everyone knows while all the RTMCC trainings and clinical consultation are divided by region, the products and the national webinars are available to a larger US-wide audience. Since this training has many new participants listening in today, I'd like to highlight that each of the five RTMCCs provides free clinical and programmatic consultations to US-based clinicians. And the responses are generally provided within one to two business days. You can click on this website here to find out the contact information for those services. All of today's faculty members have signed a declaration of disclosure, and please see the materials posted online for additional information. At the end of uh, this webinar, these are the key um, points that we hope to touch on, but now we're going to move straight into our session. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Chen, who is a professor of medicine at UCSF. Dr. Chen is also the medical director and principal investigator at the Curry Center. Lisa? Great. Thank you, Kelly. I'm going to get rid of my picture and put on the important ones um, right off the bat. Welcome, everyone. Uh, really, the collective group of all five RTMCCs and CDC are really excited to bring you the first of what's going to be two webinars to highlight the great work uh, of all the folks who are bringing us the new 2016 treatment guidelines for drug susceptible TB. Uh, in this first webinar, we really have the distinct pleasure to um, offer you guys a chance to hear straight from the folks who not only led the systematic reviews, but also the primary co-chairs of the writing group um, to have them present the information and open up for a little QA session in the end. The second webinar, which the date's not yet set yet, but uh, you'll get a notice as soon as it is, will really focus more on the programmatic issues. Um, and we're going to welcome any uh, questions people have to help guide that session uh, at the end. So to start, we start with two uh, presentations uh, by Payam Nahid. Uh, who is a professor of pulmonary and critical care medicine here at UCSF uh, with the Curry Group. He's the chair of the guideline committee. He represented the lead from the American Thoracic Society. He's an investigator for the TB Trials Consortium. And uh, important to this data is that he was the lead of one of the major groups that did the systematic reviews um, here at UCSF. The second presentation, um, Kayam will lead straight into uh, Dick Menzies' talk. Dick is well known to many people. He's a professor of medicine, uh, epidemiology, and biostats at McGill University. He's the lead of a highly productive group, right, Dick, <laughs> who's uh, done, contributed not only to the systematic reviews here for these guidelines, but also uh, key reviews that have influenced multiple global policies by the WHO. So without further ado, uh, Payam, I'm going to hand things off to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, thank you to the RTMCCs for um, giving us the opportunity to highlight the new treatment guidelines for TB. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of the writing committee um, uh, the, the guidelines uh, that, as you can see, were sponsored by ATS, CDC, and IDSA. And um, newly for this version, as compared to the prior version, um, co-endorsed by the European Respiratory Society and the US NTCA. Uh, the guidelines are officially published um, in the Clinical Infectious Diseases uh, Journal um, in October. I, I just want to make a note to all um, attendees that there are, uh, there's also an executive committee, uh, sorry, an executive summary. 
So um, be mindful of that when accessing the guidelines. There's a shorter executive summary, but what you want to be accessing is the full guideline, which is shown here, which has, is comprehensive and, and covers um, all the topics. I wanted to actually start with the acknowledgments rather than end with them, because this was uh, really a, a massive task. And, and I wanted to show you the writing committee members who were carefully selected um, uh, and screened for uh, conflicts of interest. And they included specialists in pulmonary medicine, infectious disease, pharmacokinetics, um, adult and pediatric TB, primary care, public health, and um, several um, members involved in systematic reviews. You can see that there were representatives from uh, uh, across the US, from uh, Europe, uh, from uh, South Africa, um, as well as um, um, writing committee members from the World Health Organization. So it was really a broad, diverse group of experts that uh, helped um, move this process along, and I wanted to acknowledge them. I also wanted to acknowledge my co-chair, Susan Dorman, who represented the IDSA, G.B. Migliori, who represented the ERS, Andy Vernon for CDC, and I, I led the ATS uh, effort. And my colleagues are on the line here to, to, to contribute to the discussion. Um, the backbone of uh, all the, the recommendations made in the new guidelines are based on grade methodology. And this was also a, a, a separate but um, very large um, effort. And I wanted to acknowledge the um, methodology group uh, collectively um, synthesizing the data, doing the analyses. Um, and, and the key, key thing that comes out of these uh, activities is a, a, a much deeper and clearer understanding of the quality of the studies that um, go behind the recommendations. And the quality of those studies then impact in many ways our certainty, for both our, the strength of recommendation we give and then our certainty in that recommendation as well. The certainty in, is, is driven again by the quality of the evidence. There are some disclosures I think are available to you elsewhere, but these are the disclosures that are in the guidelines themselves. I show them only to, sh to, to illustrate that the majority of um, guideline committee members uh, reported they had no relevant commercial interests, and a handful reported in interests that were managed by the ATS uh, and, and societies that were not deemed to be significant for the writing of this particular guideline. And there may have been sort of uh, some disclosures that might be pertinent, for example, to drug-resistant TB, but these are shown for you here. One of the key things to, to make, uh, to note about these guidelines is that th these are intended for uh, settings in which mycobacterial cultures, molecular and phenotypic drug susceptibility tests, radiographic studies, and other contemporary diagnostic tools are available on a routine basis. There is a WHO guideline, as you all know. In fact, the drug susceptible guideline is currently in revision for the WHO, which we also contributed to uh, at UCSF. But this guideline is intended for, for the settings in which these tests and tools are routinely available. Um, I'll just break down for you very briefly the guideline contents, because this is going to be a very high level overview of the content of the guidelines and really focusing on recommendations. But there's a lot more in the full, full text than just the recommendations made using GRADE. Um, there's uh, sections on patient-centered care and case management, um, techniques for ensuring adherence and treatment success. There's sections on treatment regimens, uh, when to decide to initiate treatment, the preferred and alternative regimens. Um, this uh, is further expanded into treatment of special, special situations or special populations. Um, with a much um, larger section on HIV as compared to the original guideline, expansion of language um, uh, in, in pregnancy and TB, um, 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 an inclusion now of, uh, again, more um, guidance on patients receiving anti-TNF drugs uh, in advanced age, uh, diabetics. And then in addition to that, all the other um, extrapulmonary manifestations of TB are also commented on with um, a very rigorous, rigorously um, researched bibliography. And I, and I think that that's one of also the strengths of this particular guideline. The TB field is publishing at a very rapid clip, but we, we sought out really the uh, quality um, references to help guide some of these um, uh, special situations, because again, they've not been randomized clinical trials, let's say, but there have been large, you know, there have been some cohort experiences, and we, we referenced those. Uh, there's also a practical aspects of treatment section on managing common side effects, um, drug-drug interactions. 
There was a call and request for more language on therapeutic drug monitoring, and that has been expanded. And then we have some um, closing information on, on, in TB treatment regarding recurrent TB, treatment failure, drug resistance, um, and uh, essentially uh, drug resistance in this regard is, is about how to be mindful of it, to have a suspicion for it in, in the right settings, and if, if empirical treatment is needed, how to manage that. Um, but again, drug resistance is not a focus of this guideline. There's a separate guideline under development um, by the same uh, societies uh, and including the CDC that will provide, a, as a companion document to this document, guidance on drug resistance, hopefully sometime next year. Uh, when one does these kinds of activities, uh, it becomes much more um, clear uh, how, uh, what areas are missing, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, adequate evidence. Uh, there, are, there are certainly areas of research that will improve our understanding of the optimal ways to manage TB. And so there's a section on the research agenda for TB treatment, and I think that uh, um, this in particular highlighted the paucity of data, for example, on TB in children, and TB in pregnancy, um, breastfeeding women, and it's very hard to make recommendations in those settings without high-quality high published um, uh, studies. A very brief comment about the GRADE methodology, which you'll hear more, more uh, examples of through Dick's, uh, Dick's uh, presentation to follow mine. Um, the grade, GRADE methodology, or GRADE itself, stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And this is now the standard um, technique by which practice guidelines are being developed. Um, the, the, it's a standardized um, approach. It um, allows one to make recommendations based on um, the certainty in the evidence, which should historically has also been the quality of the evidence. Um, and the uh, PICOs, these PICO questions, population, intervention, comparison, outcome, or PICO, um, are very directed, very clear uh, um, questions that, that then get addressed through these meta-analyses and systematic reviews. And we used, um, the, uh, for, our, for our work, um, we use methods of the Cochrane collaboration, assess the risk of bias at the outcome level um, using risk of bias tools. So really implemented the um, state of the art in, in analytic techniques to get to the best level uh, of um, evidence, uh, the, the best, to understand best what the level of evidence uh, is. So based on the um, um, certainty in the evidence, uh, you can either make a strong recommendation or a conditional recommendation. And I'll pause here. This is an important distinction that you should look for in the recommendations and the guidelines. Um, they are specifically marked as either being strong or conditional, and then they're followed with a level of certainty, um, high certainty, moderate certainty, low certainty, or very low certainty. Um, at the end of the day, just to focus here for a second on the um, conditional uh, recommendation section, this, this basically means that when it's something is conditionally recommended, the majority of individuals in this situation would want the suggested course of action, but many would not. This also takes into account that for clinicians, they would recognize that there are different choices and they might, that different choices may be appropriate for individual patients. And you'll have to work to make that um, management decision um, with the patient, in concert with the patient. For policymakers, conditional recommendations will often require substantial debate and involvement of various stakeholders to, to know how best to implement this recommendation. Strong recommendations, I think, are, are um, somewhat more straightforward. This usually is the, um, based on high quality um, evidence or high certainty in the evidence, which is born out of um, multiple randomized trials, very well designed, having a consistent signal um, of benefit or harm, whichever direction. Um, and then in this scenario, as you can see, most patients um, or most individuals in this situation would want the recommended course, and only a very small proportion would not. So there's less debate here by policymakers and clinicians. So those are the key language, um, you know, vocabulary, uh, if you will, for, for interpreting the various recommendations and why some say strong, some say conditional. So let's start with um, uh, the treatment for drug susceptible TB, which hasn't changed. Um, as many of you know, um, the fluoroquinolone-based 
um, treatment shortening trials uh, were unable to show non-inferiority to the standard six-month regimen that is being used worldwide. And so the preferred regimen remains a uh, is one that that uses the standard for four first-line drugs um, uh, during the intensive phase, and then a continuation uh, intensive phase of two months, and followed by a continuation phase of four months of isoniazid and rifampin. Um, we will go into the uh, intermittency dosing in much greater detail in Dick's talk, but uh, this remains the uh, recommended regimen until um, future trials uh, find an alternative um, regimen. So we took on nine PICO questions for our um, uh, for this guideline. We were actually counseled against taking on so many because each PICO does re require a systematic review. Um, and uh, but we, we felt that these were nine that we could manage and, and expanded our team of great methodologies to make it happen. Um, the first one was should case management. So what I, I'm sorry, what I'll do here is I will state each PICO question uh, and then show you the recommendation and then provide some context. But this will be a very high level uh, overview again. So the first question was should case management be provided to patients receiving curative TB therapy to improve outcomes? And by case management, we meant patient education, counseling, field home visits, integration, coordination of care with specialists, medical home, um, patient reminders, incentives, enablers, really a whole span of um, uh, case management techniques. And in fact, each one of these ends up having its own um, uh, assessment as a PICO question and its own evidence profile. Um, the uh, Based on the, the data that was reviewed and synthesized through meta-analyses, we um, suggest use, using case management interventions during treatment of TB uh, patients. This is a conditional recommendation with low certainty in the evidence. Um, in particular uh, of note was the impact of patient education um, and, and counseling, um, as well as incentives and enablers in, in improving outcomes. So that there was a real um, uh, there was a, a real impact there. The second question we handled somewhat separately, uh, which uh, related to SAT and DOT. Does SAT of medications have similar outcomes compared to directly observed therapy in patients with TB? We took the position in uh, answering this question that DOT was essentially the standard of care worldwide at this stage across many programs um, in the US and Europe in particular. And so we were looking at uh, from that perspective that with DOT being the standard of care, uh, is there enough evidence to suggest that SAT should replace DOT going forward? And based on, um, uh, let's see, this is the, one of the grade profiles, one of the evidence profiles that I wanted to bring to your attention. I apologize, they're small. I was told to note for you that at the top of your screen, there's an, a, a way to expand your slides so you can see the, this in full screen. Um, but here you can see, I'll just draw your attention. Here is the, oh, well, I need the mouse, sorry. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, here you have the quality assessment. And the quality assessments used for, for this grade methodology um, include an evaluation of um, risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, other considerations such as uh, publication bias, for example. And then you have your um, interventions here. So uh, just to reorient you, that you have SAT, DOT listed here uh, in these columns. And uh, what we see with um, uh, DOT uh, is that, uh, in particular, for treatment success, uh, there's an improvement with moderate level of evidence uh, in in uh, in um, uh, DOT as compared to SAT, and time to smear conversion, which was uh, actually a culture uh, smear conversion at at eight weeks, which was what was available in the literature. That's also improved with uh, DOT. So there was no evidence to suggest that um, SAT was superior or even equivalent to DOT to suggest that we should change the current standard of practice or make a recommendation. Uh, that would change it. So we suggest using DOT rather than SAT for routine treatment of patients with all forms of TB. This is a conditional recommendation, low certainty in the evidence. The next question we asked was, should tuberculosis medications be dosed daily or intermittently in the intensive phase of treatment? Um, should tuberculosis medications be de dosed daily or intermittently in the continuation phase of treatment was handled separately? These will be uh, discussed in great detail by Dick Menzies to follow my talk. The fifth question we asked was around the initiation of antiretroviral therapy during TB 
treatment compared to the end um, and uh, during the, during tuberculosis treatment compared to the end of tuberculosis treatment, um, do, does that improve outcomes among TB patients co-infected with HIV? As you might recall, this is this was an area for which the 2003 guidelines essentially said you could start antiretroviral therapy at the end of TB treatment. And so this is one of the areas in which there's, there's a substantial change. Um, and this change is driven by um, very high quality randomized clinical trials um, and, and several of them that showed that um, there are advantages to early, uh, again, I'm going to draw my, um, draw your attention to with uh, the, so you have uh, pooled estimates provided here, uh, as well as the events per, uh, per number of patients for early initiation of ART, which is um, uh, uh, during treatment for TB. And some, there was some range of dates uh, or weeks from initiation of TB treatment in the various studies, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a, bit, in a bit. But certainly early versus late. And there are, advantage, at certain, there are clear advantages in AIDS-defining illness or death um, as outcomes. Um, in mortality. So early initiation of antiretroviral therapy certainly improved uh, outcomes uh, um, for patients. There was, as you note, an increase in iris, so 15% versus 9% for those who started late. That's not perhaps surprising. What was um, informative is to look carefully at these events of iris and, and note that they are um, I, m predominantly manageable uh, um, episodes of virus, so they're not uh, representing um, major major issues. Again, the DOT has suggested rather than SAT based on conditional, but based on low certainty in the evidence, but uh, conditional recommendation. Um, we talked about daily versus intermittent, um, will be covered by Dick, and this was the slide that I was showing you uh, in regard to the um, early versus late uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy. And so for these evidence profiles, we have the quality assessment, as I, I noted. Um, for each outcome of interest, we have the pooled estimates. So iris was one um, endpoint, mortality another, AIDS-defining illness another, treatment success, and so on and so forth. And then you grade the certainty in the evidence, um, as, as shown here, from very low to, to high. Uh, and so here, um, just to draw your attention again, for mortality and for AIDS-defining illness, there's clear benefits to starting antiretroviral therapy early. There is some increase in iris, um, a, a proportion of patients experienced iris, but, but they were all, rep major majority of which were reported as being mild and manageable. The next question. Um, so I'm sorry. So based on that evidence, um, we the, to, the, to answer the question, does initiation of antiretroviral therapy during TB treatment compared to the end of TB treatment improve outcomes? We recommend initiating antiretroviral therapy during TB treatment, um, optimally by 8 to 12 weeks of TB treatment initiation uh, for patients with CD4 counts greater than 50. Um, and then within the first two weeks of TB treatment for patients with a CD4 count of less than 50, this is a strong recommendation based on high certainty in the evidence. There is one exception that is raised in the guidelines and referenced uh, to a specific uh, randomized trial in which in patients with HIV infection and TB meningitis, um, this early initiation of first, within the first two weeks was linked to worse outcomes. Um, presumably because of the iris and related to TB meningitis. So this is an area of caution and, and interpretation. But um, this matches up with the international community now and their timing of antiretroviral therapy um, being early, as early as feasible, uh, taking all things into consideration. Now, we just made a recommendation saying that antiretroviral therapy should be used in all TB HIV patients during TB treatment. Um, but the committee recognized that this, uh, there may be times and extenuating circumstances in which the antiretroviral therapy may not um, be um, available or initiated uh, during TB treatment. And we asked the question, uh, linked to that query, does extending treatment beyond six months improve outcomes compared to standard six-month regimen among TB patients co-infected with HIV? As you recall, the, the 2003 guidelines recommended a six-month regimen for TB regardless of HIV um, serostatus. And we recommend, based on our 
meta-analyses that uh, Dick ran that for HIV-infected patients receiving antiretroviral therapy, we suggest using a standard six-month regimen. So that's concert with um, the regimen, uh, the guidance before. Um, the in uncommon situations in which HIV-infected patients do not receive antiretroviral therapy during tuberculosis treatment, we, su we suggest extending the continuation phase to seven months in duration, corresponding to a total of nine months of therapy. Um, it's a conditional recommendation um, with very low certainty in the evidence. Um, and I think this is something that operationally would be a decision that one would make, uh, for example, at the end of TB treatment if that HIV TB patient has not received antiretroviral therapy for whatever reason that someone that consideration should be given for extending treatment. And the basis of that is this grade profile, evidence profile that I'm showing you now that I hope hopefully you can see. Again, quality assessments, pooled estimates shown here for six-month regimen and eight months or longer regimen. And then the outcomes of interest shown in these um, uh, um, here in, in uh, failure, relapse, uh, and so when you uh, look at um, relapse in patients not taking antiretroviral therapies, it's a subset of population, uh, you will note that the risk of relapse is 18% in those who received six-month regimens as compared to 5% in those receiving eight months or longer, uh, and with a, um, an adjusted odds ratio of 3.1. So this is a very low certainty in the evidence because these are um, some predominantly, and many of them are observational trials, and there's some questions about the, the designs, but um, with, with serious issues around inconsistency, but it is, it is a conditional recommendation. Seventh uh, question we addressed was the use of adjuvant, adjuvant corticosteroids in TB pericarditis. Does it provide a morta mortality or morbidity benefits? As you recall, in the prior guidelines, um, adjuvant corticosteroids were routinely recommended for TB pericarditis. However, based on a large randomized trial published in the New England Journal, the largest to date, um, of a, um, a, a somewhat of a unique trial design, it was a factorial design with an um, uh, immune modulating agent uh, as the other intervention. Um, we, we did not find any benefit, um, routine benefit from adjuvant corticosteroids, and so we suggest that initial adjuvant, adjunctive corticosteroid therapy not be routinely used in patients with TB pericarditis. Uh, this is a conditional recommendation. The clinical trial found the same um, result, essentially. Um, this, the one uh, stipulation would be uh, steroid, corticosteroids could be used in patients who appear to be at high risk for constrictive pericarditis, but it shouldn't be routinely used. Um, the, the next question was about adjuvant corticosteroids. Does the use of adjuvant corticosteroids in TB meningitis provide mortality and morbidity benefits? Uh, there's clear evidence here um, across um, several trials that um, there's benefits related to adjuvant corticosteroids. So we recommend initial adjunctive corticosteroid therapy with dexamethasone or prednisolone given for six weeks for patients with TB meningitis. This is a strong recommendation, moderate certainty evidence. Um, there are sources on the web that provide guidance on how to administer the steroids um, with uh, some, some uh, uh, direction on uh, tapering, um, the, so that the, those are not in this particular guideline but available through other society guidelines. Um, the final question we, we addressed was among HIV infected, sorry, among HIV negative patients, the original question was to include adults and children with palsy bacillary TB i.e. confirmed to be smear negative, culture negative, does a shorter duration of treatment have similar outcomes compared to the standard six-month treatment duration? The reason confirmed is bolded there is because we, we, un, we wanted to underscore and did so in the text the importance of um, having a certainty in the quality of the sputum that you are obtaining or the samples that you're obtaining and that this, these individuals are indeed smear and culture negative and these are not false negatives because of laboratory contamination or laboratory um, handling or uh, sputum quality. So with that said, if a patient is confirmed to be smear negative, culture negative, um, we suggest that a four-month treatment regimen is adequate for treatment of HIV negative adult patients with smear negative and culture negative pulmonary TB this is a conditional recommendation, very low certainty in the evidence, 
and we were unable to address the children because there are no studies in children. So uh, just to wrap up, the, the key changes, some of the key changes and updates from the 2000 edition, 2003 edition are that um, as compared to that prior edition, we now recommend uh, early initiation of antiretroviral therapy in all HIV TB patients. Um, we suggest that the duration of TB treatment in HIV patients for, who, who do not receive antiretroviral therapy during their TB therapy should be extended. In the guidelines, we have provided a much greater um, uh, evidence, uh, evidence base uh, for the intermittent therapies, um, and uh, those will be covered next. But um, this is jumping a little bit of the gun, but once weekly treatment in the continuation phase is no longer recommended. Um, we also expanded the evidence base um, and um, uh, bibliography for case management uh, strategies, patient education in particular, incentives enablers, DOT, and uh, that, that's been enhanced in the latest guideline. We've expanded the language around TB treatment in pregnancy uh, and updated it for PZA, um, highlighting that in, in certain settings in pregnancy, pyrazinamide use may be warranted, in particular patients with HIV or, or severe disease, um, and that it's not necessarily always um, should be avoided. Uh, and then steroids are no longer routinely recommended for TB pericarditis, but could be used um, for selected cases in which constricted pericarditis is, is uh, um, a concern. Um, I just close by thanking, um, again, leadership from the societies, from CDC. I wanted to particularly recognize um, Kevin Wilson from uh, ATS, who's the documents editor, worked with us very carefully, and Jan Brozek, who guided us uh, in our great methodology work. Um, this was reviewed by all the, by, by three to four, sometimes six members for each one of these societies, and um, over 350, possibly close to 400 reviewer comments were individually addressed in the writing of this. We also so, uh, sought out um, uh, input on language used, the patient-centered aspects from community research advisory group of the CDC, TBTC, and the treatment action group. Um, and again, I wanted to just thank um, the writing committee members who persisted through the many versions and revisions and questions, and, and my co-chairs, Susan, GB, and Andy. Thank you. OK. So hi, uh, everybody. Dick Mendes here. I'm actually going to pick up the phone. And I hope that everyone can hear me uh, um, and jump in and to talk about the evidence review for intermittent therapy, as that is one area that is both some important changes, perhaps, in the recommendations, but also uh, has fairly substantial programmatic implications. I'd like to also thank uh, Lisa and the many sponsoring groups and societies that have participated both in the production of the of the guidelines, but also in the today's webinar production. And I would certainly like to acknowledge Payam for his leadership in the guidelines and providing me with the opportunity to not only provide evidence and give this talk, but to uh, participate in the numerous revisions. Um, <clears throat> OK, so let me move on. And hopefully, I'm able to skillfully uh, negotiate the uh, moving of slides. Um, uh, so the two questions um, were, again, as Payam said, uh, intermittent uh, dosing in the intensive phase, so in the first two months, generally speaking. And then uh, what about intermittent dosing in the continuation phase, meaning, again, for the standard six months regimen, the last four months? Um, hopefully, I'm using definitions that everybody uh, is familiar with. OK, so very briefly, I'm going to run through quite a bit of evidence. Uh, these are not in the form of grade tables. For those of you who were uh, looking at those grade tables in some degree of bafflement, um, hopefully this will be a bit more um, like a talk you might hear uh, at, a, at a symposium. So there is a n there are a number of other reviews, and I'm sort of this is going to be, a, if you will, a bit of a review of reviews, and I'm going to end with an updated review that is not yet published, I've been part of, um, uh, which I think also helps to answer some questions that I've heard already. OK, so 
Uh, one point to make is that we consider the best evidence to be a randomized trial where in that trial the primary question is, you know, intermittent versus daily. And a systematic review was done really back in 2001. Uh, and in that uh, Cochrane review, which tend to be very high quality reviews, uh, only a single trial was found with a total of just under 300, um, sorry, a total of 400, that should be 399 patients. Uh, and um, so about 200 people per arm. There was a small difference in uh, relapse rates um, with the three times weekly throughout. But as you see, the rates were all small, were all low, and so the differences were not significant. So they concluded there was no evidence of significant difference, but there was also very few trials where the schedule of intermittent versus daily was actually the question. There was really only one trial. Um, OK, so again, I'm relying on the people who type to let me know if ever I'm not progressing. So moving to the next slide. So dosing schedules of six-month regimens and relapse. So this was a review published in the Blue Journal uh, about a decade ago, 17 studies about 5,000 patients. So here you have different, uh, it's a relative risk. So the daily throat had the lowest rate of relapse. And then you see that when it was daily in the first two months, then three times weekly, it was a bit higher, 1.6 times higher. So typically relapse rates in these large meta-analyses average with a six-month regimen three to four percent. So if 3 to 4% is for daily, then 1.6 would be around 6% relapse rates. Then daily followed by twice a week in the continuation phase, uh, these, this would be 2.8 times higher. And then three times weekly throughout, um, now this is five times higher, so really quite substantially higher. This is relapse only. And the same study, they noted that uh, the risk was greater if there was cavitation or the two months was culture positive, which again are well known as risk factors for relapse. So this might be, for later discussion, a, a particular group to be concerned about when you're using the intermittent regimens. Um, also, they noted that the very highest rates were as once weekly repenting. Again, I've not shown those specific results. So then uh, there's a review, um, which I've Im modeled modestly called Menzies Review, but I was the first author. So this was a review of older studies up to 2008, published in PLOS Medicine in 2009. Fairly, um, again, this particular review, we only considered randomized trials and only bacteriologically confirmed uh, cases, of course, so no clinical cases, and also bacteriologically confirmed failure or relapse and acquired drug resistance. And only uh, um, uh, studies with six months at least of therapy, and that included, of course, INH and rifampin. So reasonably uh, close to the current regimen that is, you know, standard use, in standard use. So in this, again, it's kind of the typical uh, schematic, uh, but essentially a lot of titles reviewed. We came down to 57 randomized trials that had been done in TB in this interval from 1970 uh, up till 2008, which tells you, uh, just as a side note, just how many trials sometimes are needed to get us to where we finally have the regimen we have today, which is the, the six-month regimen with two months of INH rifampin, pyrazinamide, and so on. It takes, it takes really a lot of work to kind of hammer out the best regimen. OK, so what did this review show? So I, uh, first of all, uh, one kind of striking point was that in all these trials, all 57 trials, there was no trial that looked at the so-called Denver regimen in a randomized trial. So there was no trial where they either started from the 
day one or after two weeks and then went to twice weekly for the rest of the treatment. So that was kind of striking. Uh, three times a week, though, there were trials. Um, and three times a week could be from day one, from, in other words, the first dose, or after two weeks, so, or, or one week, as sometimes occurred. All of these were considered three times a week throughout. And as you see, there was some uh, slight increase, significant though, in uh, failure rates and uh, quite a substantial increase in acquired drug resistance. That's what ADR stands for. Um, quite significant, although the absolute rates were quite low, and I'll come back to that point later. OK, so moving on, then there was another review just of children, intermittent versus daily. Uh, this was, again, a meta-analysis. They identified four uh, trials uh, with 466 children. And in these trials, uh, children received either twice weekly uh, or daily. Um, and basically, they found that the twice weekly was uh, not as good. So the rate, so this is 0.27 means the odds of treatment success was quite a bit lower than in children who had daily therapy. And they analyzed it different ways. One way it was clearly significant, so-called per protocol, and intention to treat uh, was not um, significant, although still the intermittent regimen was uh, worse. Uh, then uh, again, HIV infected. So I'm sort of running through a variety of populations, if you will, where the same question has been addressed. This particular one is a review of treatment of active TB and HIV co-infected, led by my colleague here at McGill Fazcan. Um, Again, uh, pretty standard, but in this particular tri um, review, we included cohort studies or observational studies as well as randomized trials, primarily because there simply were not that many randomized trials. Again, uh, a lot of titles reviewed. We ended up with 27 studies. And in fact, we did a first review, then we updated it a few years later. And this slide doesn't seem to come out quite as clearly, but let me just say we added another seven uh, studies. So a total of about 30 studies included in this review. OK, so rushing on. So um, when we looked at all studies all together, and here perhaps I'll pull up pointer. So when we looked at all studies all together, we uh, could basically, we divided studies into daily throughout or, or, or sorry, daily in the initial phase. They could have been any regimen after the initial phase, or they were three times a week from the beginning. And the three times a week, you can see quite a bit higher rates of failure and relapse and acquired drug resistance. So quite, we thought, important differences. The confidence intervals are very wide. Um, so I've only highlighted the, um, the absolute estimates. But again, you'll see that you know, it's two to three times higher uh, rates of failure, relapse, and acquired drug resistance. Mortality was not different. And again, mortality is quite high. These, some of these are older studies. So going on to the next, when, uh, <clears throat> when we adjusted for various confounding factors, we still see that now just now instead of these are not percents, so not rates, these are odds relative to daily. So daily is the reference group. So three times a week would have twice as high rates of failure. Relapse would have, again, about twice as high. Acquired drug resistance about three and a half times higher. So again, these are all with all studies. So some patients not on antiretroviral therapy. So now we tried to stratify. And again, I've just highlighted sort of the, the rates. So this is the left-hand column is always not on antiretroviral. And the right-hand column would be on antiretroviral, not on, on, and so on. So this is, again, the 30 studies split into Patient, you know, it's basically the, the years when the studies were done, of course. Um, so here you see 
not on antiretroviral, high rates of much higher rates uh, of failure and relapse, uh, but on antiretroviral only relapse was different. Again, this is just one way of analyzing the data. You've also seen the same information presented to you by PIAM, um, where the absolute numbers were quite different. Uh, okay, so the final review uh, was led by uh, James Johnson, or Jay Johnson, at UBC, and I was a distant reviewer. Um, so again, the first strategy I just I showed you, this was the, the one that I claimed authorship of up to 2008. And then the second review just overlapped a little bit up until really March of this year, so pretty up to date. And again, we, what we ended up with, just to kind of show you, so the first review we had 57 studies. This up-to-date review we had another seven studies. So we ended up with a total when we kind of cleaned it up and took things out, where they were drug-sensitive TB, or DST was not done, but they were new cases, which happens in some settings, and at least six months of rifampin use. So then you see these numbers, so 108 arms. So again, one study could have several arms, of course, but 13,000 patients, so large numbers of patients when you pool all these studies together. And as I said, the primary analysis, drug-sensitive TB or DST not done, but they were new cases, at least six months of rifampin. Uh, and again, we compared, we, we grouped everything into daily, which we considered five days a week or more, uh, daily intensive, so the first two months, then twice a week, daily for the first two months, then three times a week, and then three times a week throughout, meaning from either from day one or after one week or two weeks of daily. And again, just to reiterate, even in the update, we have not found any randomized trials where twice a week was given throughout from the beginning to the end. The so-called Denver regimen has not been included in any randomized trial that we've been able to find. OK, so um, I think actually I will uh, perhaps jump forward. So these are the absolute, if you will, event rates, um, daily versus intermittent. So here's daily versus three times a week. So this is initial phase. So from the beginning, daily in the initial, no matter what happened after, or three times a week from the beginning. And you see that uh, the failure rate's a bit higher, not significant. The relapse rate's quite a bit higher and significantly different. And the acquired drug resistance is higher, but again, the absolute numbers are small and the not a significant difference in this analysis. Dick, can you hold the phone close to your mouth? Oh, sorry. The continuation phase, um, and I need to get the pointer here. So the continuation phase, so this is now, so you either have daily from the beginning and right through, or daily for the first two months, then three times a week, or daily, then twice a week. So again, what you see is a bit of a trend in failure. It gets higher with uh, more intermittent regimens. Relapse, there's clearly a difference again when you start with daily, then, then twice a week. And acquired drug resistance, just very, very low rates in total. And when we do adjusted analysis, so-called meta-regression, so here now these are odds ratios. So daily throughout becomes the reference group. Then we have daily, then three times a week. So you see maybe a slight increase, but not significantly different. Daily, then twice a week, we see that the failure rates are significantly higher. And then three times a week throughout, failure, relapse, and acquired drug resistance are all higher in terms of these adjusted odds ratios relative to daily throughout. And there's details at the bottom of the slide as to what it's adjusted for. Um, again, I just mentioned that this, although it's been submitted for publication, this is not yet published. It was presented at WHO guidelines um, last summer. Um, 
and uh, so it's sort of been in the public domain since then, but not yet published. Last summer, meaning July of this year. Okay, so sensitivity analysis. So basically, because uh, you know questions are raised and so on, we tried the analysis a variety of ways. So first of all, we tried drug only drug senses. So if they didn't have a DST, even though they were new cases, very unlikely to be resistant, we dropped them. Didn't matter. We tried all studies like my own analysis earlier. No difference. There were some studies where there was streptomycin included. We took them out. Nothing changed. Uh, we we um, looked at drug resistance strains only. Similar findings. We looked at regimens only you know, purely the standard regimen everyone uses now. And uh, again, no difference in findings. And then finally, we took out uh, a few studies where it was only HIV infected. Again, nothing happened. So all of these different sensitivity analyses were tried, and the findings were basically the same. I'm not going to show all those results, obviously. OK, so we just had a few other issues that have come up along the way. How many studies use DOT? So the majority of studies, and virtually all of the studies using intermittent regimens, use DOT. Some of them used it only in part. So again, uh, depended on the regimen, but uh, did not use 29%. And these were mostly the daily regimens that did not use DOT. So uh, one issue for quality is how many studies had less than 10% total loss to follow up, default, transfer out, unknown, et cetera. So two thirds of the studies had less than 10% of these all in. Uh, no one knows what's going on. Although one third of studies did have more than 10%. So we judge those as lower quality. Uh, HIV infected, 11% of all patients uh, were HIV infected in this review. And how many were older studies? So prior to 1990, 69% of the studies. Uh, so you see that really most of these studies are older, even though the regimens are familiar. Again, this reflects the evidence base for the regimens we use uh, nowadays and the drugs we use nowadays. And finally, conclusions. So intermittent three times a week from the beginning or after two weeks has higher rates of failure, relapse, and acquired drug resistance in multiple reviews. And then I'm just kind of listed again as a reminder which uh, studies. So the Cochrane review, it was higher, not significant. In the Chang review, relapse was significantly higher. The children, again, significantly higher. Uh, my own review in 2009, failure and acquired drug resistance. HIV TB only if ARV is not given. And then the 2016 update review, again, all outcomes. Very little published evidence uh, in terms of randomized trials from the Denver regimen. And finally, uh, daily initially, then twice weekly intermittent higher rates of relapse. And daily initially followed by three times a week seems to be as good as daily in at least the three reviews where it's been looked at carefully. OK, and finally, I just a few limitations. Uh, again, as mentioned, very few large-scale randomized trials with direct comparisons. Uh, most studies are have been conducted in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, however, I think you know the quality of these at least during the studies, was high. Dropout rates and non-adherence was low. Uh, some studies did not use PZA, but when we did sensitivity analysis arms with PZA only, we found the same findings. I think probably the other is that the absolute effect size is small. We're talking typically of a difference in relapse rates, even if the odds is two or three times higher, the absolute difference might be 4%. Uh, acquired drug resistance, the absolute difference is only 1%. Acquired drug resistance is very, very uncommon with the regimen we are using in drug-sensitive patients. So again, the, the absolute effect is small. And at least in one review, uh, the majority of relapse occurred in people with known risk factors for relapse. So cavitary disease, 
smear positive or culture positive at two months. Uh, strengths. So, I mean, uh, this is a large number of studies and large numbers of patients. Uh, the studies only included people with n n no patients with clinically diagnosed TB were included in these reviews. Uh, pretty consistent results from multiple reviews in adults, children, HIV infected. And again, not always significant, but the trends were quite consistent. Um, in three reviews, multivariate analysis was used to adjust. Findings, if anything, were strengthened. And the findings are from many countries, which might make things more real life. So um, just to acknowledge the uh, people who participated in the different reviews, uh, Jay Johnson, Jonathan Campbell from UBC, and 2008, a bigger crew, and the HIV review as well. Large numbers of people have helped by contributing data, thoughts, comments, etc. And I think that's it for me. Hi, it's Lisa. I think we're back on. Can you advance uh, the slide? So thank you, Dick. Thank you, Payam. Um, there are additional slides to Dick Menzies' set. They're not areas that we're covering uh, this no. time around. Um, we thought we'd just leave those in case questions came up only. Yep. Yeah, it, it's, it's a freebie from Dick Menzies. So <laughs> what I'd like to do is see the slide set up for our panelists. And so for the rest of you, this is... This is where we get to open up for about a half hour, your opportunity to uh, throw some questions our way via the chat. Of course, we can't get to all of these questions. And I'm really hoping that either through the chat questions or through uh, an additional uh, link that we're going to give you, a person to email with other programmatic questions, we'll be able to inform the second webinar uh, um, led by the RTMCCs to really address more of the nuts and bolts and practical issues um, that these new guidelines might mean to programs. So what I'd like to do is welcome to join both um, Pyam and Dick will stay on the line, um, but we're going to add, for your listening pleasure, of course, always Dave Ashkin, who's the medical director and co-principal investigator for the Southeastern National TB Center in Florida. He's also the medical director of the Florida Department of Health TV program. Um, Susan Dorman, uh, we're very fortunate to have as well. She was the co-chair from IDSA for the guideline development. She's a professor of medicine and international health at John Hopkins. And last but not least, Andy, um, Andy Vernon from the CDC, the chief of the clinical research branch at DTBE, and as well the co-chair for the guideline development for CDC. So let's make sure we um, unmute you all. Uh, go ahead and do uh, hash six to unmute. And um, I know Dave is also kind of fielding the chat questions a bit, but we're gonna we, we've got a starter set of a, of a couple of questions just to get people going. So um, we've had preliminary calls, of course, between between the panel group here, and one of the issues that came up is the question of, you know, when we look at these large systematic reviews and meta-analyses that look at um, often data that's not from randomized controlled trials, uh, people will also question, boy, there's a lot of data from international uh, studies or, or from a long time period, maybe when treatment um, was a little bit different. Um, maybe the populations are a little bit different or the regimens may be different that we're currently using. It, it's really the question that comes up to people's minds, are these really applicable to our current day practice? And, and so the question really is, from a practical standpoint, um, panel members, how would you advise program people listening who may have these questions about whether or not the data that guided uh, the recommendations uh, are truly relevant to our, our practice uh, in the states now? So let me start with Andy um, from the CDC. Um, um, any advice you have for folks? And just, again, hash six to unmute your phone. This is Andy Vernon. Great. You can hear you, Andy. 
we consider this, as Payam noted in his presentation, uh, perhaps the strongest form of evidence uh, that, that we can uh, consider in the process of developing recommendations. Uh, practices are, of course, also influenced by practical considerations, including cost and uh, uh, acceptability, uh, among others. But uh, uh, with regard to the expected efficacy of specific practices, this we consider this to be very strong evidence. Great. Um, you know, Payam, Dick, would either one of you want to weigh in um, on this issue? Um, I'll, I'll, yeah, I, I would just add that within the quality assessments that are done in these evidence profiles that I, uh, admittedly, they're busy, but these are what the profiles that we worked with in making our recommendations, you'll note that these quality assessments are standard assessments um, around risk of bias, inconsistency. For example, inconsistency between studies would downgrade um, uh, a particular um, uh, evidence, uh, quality, our view of the quality of the evidence. Indirectness happens to be one of those quality assessments as well, and indirectness can be something as, um, I suppose, plain as this is a study in adults, but so it'd be indirect to a question on children. Um, but it also incorporates uh, potentially indirectness as it relates to, let's say, studies done in a very high incidence, low resource setting um, in, in relation to potentially another setting which has low incidence of TB but well, is well resourced. So those things are all factored in into the final scoring, if you will, of the, of the certainty in the evidence. Um, and uh, so I think it's a good, good question. It is, as Andy said, the best available uh, evidence out there in the world. So until there's more published from, uh, ex you know, the, low incidence, well resourced settings, and you know, we, th these are the data that we have to work with. Well, I think, in fact, Andy, you know, prev in one of the preview calls, you had mentioned that there is a large effort um, underway by CDC to look more closely at U.S. data. Maybe you can expound on that just a bit. The report of a verified case of tuberculosis, the official report form that's used for surveillance purposes, has undergone uh, several modifications over the past two decades. And coupled with our ability to currently to genotype the vast majority of positive pulmonary cultures of TB, uh, we are increasingly here at CDC able to uh, assess treatment outcomes. And so I think in the future we'll be looking carefully at f uh, outcomes in association with uh, uh, various aspects of individual patients, including the regimens or, or uh, modalities that were employed in their treatment. In order to be practical, those forms do not collect uh, substantial detail regarding individual patients. So. Uh, our ability to use surveillance data in this regard will have some limitations. Uh, we're very interested in investigating uh, ways to combine the advantages of the ongoing collection of surveillance information with the strength of data that are generated by clinical trials uh, approaches such, such as randomization. Uh, perhaps in the future to allow us to generate even stronger information from the activities in which all programs are engaged in an ongoing basis. Andy, this is uh, Dave Askin. You know, I just want to ask a question kind of in, that is, is on the chat and we said we would discuss, and I think this question is really for Piam and Dick and Susan too. But, you know, we hear terms like, and you used the term before that this is the strong recommendation, or, you know, we heard uh, before uh, uh, Dick talk about that this is significantly higher, you know. But I think some of the confusion comes down to is the, the definition of the terms we use. Like, usually if we're using a term significantly, many of us in the medical community think about statistically significant 
Or sometimes when we're hearing strong recommendation, while I think you'd agree, and I, Andy, I get you, you're saying, hey, this is, a, this is based on the best information we have, but then strong recommendation is different than what we'd say conditional based on the grade system. And I was just wondering if we could, you know, like one of the questions that was asked was, please explain conditional recommendations and certainty again. I would think DOT would be higher than conditional and below certainty. And I think in our everyday language as we're speaking, we use terms that aren't, you know, that are getting confused back and forth by their definitions, the way we use them in everyday language versus how they're sometimes used in statistics or in recommendations. Time, would you, would you like, first, and before we even go there, I have to make this statement. I want to thank you guys for, I think, one of the most amazing documents that TV has had, if not ever, in a long time. Um, it is, an, and I'm just making this, this recommendation for everybody out there. I highly recommend you take a look at it. It has over 500 citations, such great practical you know, information, and again, really reviews the literature. So I can't, I can't not thank you guys for doing it. So Payam, or whoever, I'd like to go back to that question about the language and, and statements such as we were asked, would DOT would be considered higher than conditional, and how you would answer that. Sure. Um, th this process of grade methodology is it's actually not new. It's, it probably feels new to, some, to many of us in the TV field, but it's been around um, for many years now and is used across all practice guidelines um, essentially as the standard uh, in other diseases as well. Uh, and in fact, there's a movement to not allow um, uh, guidelines that don't use grade methodology to proceed to publication um, um, uh, as practice guidelines. So th th this is a strong movement towards this, and it's, um, we're coming to it a little bit late, but it is a good system. Um, the way the system works is, uh, as I noted, um, you, you collect all the data that addresses the question that has been posed, the PICO question, and then you look at the outcomes of interest that the c committee panel members feel clinicians and end users and providers and patients want to know about. And that would you know, usually include things like, what's my you know, risk of mortality on this? Uh, what's my chance of cure? Um, what about relapse? Or what about um, um, acquiring drug resistance? So those are the outcomes that we select. Um, and then the intervention uh, and the comparison in the PICO kind of uh, acronym there are compared to each other and pooled estimates are made. Now, there's a whole variety of studies types that go into this. And uh, as a committee, we decided that we would only include randomized clinical trials if we could include only randomized clinical trials. But if there are questions that just frankly didn't have randomized clinical trials, but they were still important to clinicians and providers, that we would then sort of look at, um, you know, in some ways, the lower, lower level of quality of, of studies, like cohort studies or observational studies that don't have the randomization to them to um, uh, take, take into account you know, residual confounding. Um, with these quality assessments, we then are able to um, determine whether the certainty we have in the evidence that has been gathered for that particular outcome, let's say mortality, or let's do the SAT DOT one. The SAT DOT one, I told you, treatment success um, sh was shown to be um, better in uh, DOT, a study in the arms that use DOT versus SAT. Um, we assess the quality of, of evidence and give it a score. That's the certainty in the evidence. So it goes from very low to high. The reason why there might be some confusion to the readers about why DOT versus SAT, for example, isn't a higher certainty in the evidence is because by convention, you score the overall certainty in the evidence for the PICO question according to the lowest level of evidence for a given outcome, for, for any outcome uh, that you've selected. So mortality happened to have very little information, very few trials that were helpful in mortality as it related to DOT and SAT. And the certainty in the evidence of that was very low. So that becomes the lowest level across all the outcomes assessed. And even if treatment success had moderate quality of evidence, we are, by convention, conveying to the, to the reader that um, this, this particular PICO question that incorporates all these things, including patient values, um, has, in general, at its lowest level, a very low quality of evidence or very low certainty in the evidence. And that's why you get that kind of uh, information. 
This is Susan Dorman. Go ahead, Susan. I'd, yeah, I'd, uh, thank, thanks, Lisa. I'd also like to add that um, while the, the PICO and the grade process really does add uh, rigor uh, to the guidelines and to the process of formulating the guidelines, the conventions of language that Payam talked about do, um, you know, do, do include some uh, constraints. And so with that in mind, the writing committee really endeavored to, in the fuller version of the, the text, so not the executive summary, but the fuller version, the committee really endeavored to explain uh, some of the rationale and, and the evidence, you know, insofar as permitted by page limitations and whatnot, but really tried to give um, give the reader, give you guys a sense of, of uh, uh, where the recommendations were coming from and some of the um, nuances around them. So I would encourage folks to, to um, also have a look at the fuller text. I, I think that's it's really true. It, it's 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 well written. There are a lot of practical issues addressed in there. Um, so there's a link to the guidelines um, listed around this webinar, and I, I'd you know think everyone might want to have that link on their desktop computers in their clinics. But and so so I think what we can appreciate is this is an extensive process. And a lot of the concerns we have, like, boy, does this data really relate to what I do, is it's actually those kind of considerations are built into how you're making these recommendations um, according to a standardized protocol that you, you apply to everything. So I think that you know where we like to think we could do that in our heads when we just are seeing a patient in front of us and we, and we know we've read some of the um, literature, uh, you guys have done that in a very rigorous way in order to give us these recommendations. And, and the care that has to be taken is how we read that when we see strong versus conditional, we just have to remember how those terms are being presented. So that really helps you guys. It really helps. I, I hope it helps people who are listening. Um, I want to go to another question before I hit, hit some from the chat, because I know this is something that came up in many of the planning calls. And we just want to um, dig in a little here, because we have these folks on the, uh, on the panel, and again, this is probably an issue that will come up in the second webinar for sure, but a lot of programs who are listening use intermittent treatment in whatever fashion um, as their standard protocol. And uh, many people will say that they have great experience and great outcomes with it. So I'm sure in the background, when you guys were developing these recommendations, there was a lot of internal debate um, and careful wording uh, about because you knew what kind of impact this would have on programs. So if if you're going to give some kind of practical guidance to programs of how to look at these new um, recommendations for intermittent use of intermittent treatment, um, what would be your take home message? And um, Susan, you've got a practical voice. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to pull you into this first, if that's all sure. right. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, and I think it's fair to say that many of us do come from programs where intermittent uh, or even highly intermittent therapy is regularly used. Um, and our, our charge, though, um, as a guidelines writing committee was to review the data and, and use, the, use the published data to formulate guidance. Um, and really, as, as Dick described, uh, the data uh, around intermittent uh, versus daily treatment uh, were really thoroughly and, and very formally reviewed and then were discussed um, by the committee in, in great depth and on a number of occasions. Perhaps a couple of key points um, that, that, um, that I took from this that might be helpful. Um, our first, that uh, with regard to daily versus, versus intermittent therapy, the results around outcomes really are consistent across multiple reviews and, and multiple populations. And I think as Dick mentioned, the differences are not always statistically significant, but the trends are quite consistent, um, and he presented uh, that information. And I, I think those, those trends are important in thinking about guidelines. Um, 
although when we work with individual patients, you know, we also need to think about the individual details of, of the circumstance. Um, I think the, the, the data and the reviews also point towards a couple of factors that increase the risk of poor outcomes with intermittent treatment, treatment and those being um, untreated HIV, uh, as well as um, cavitation and, and other measures of high bacillary burden before treatment. And so, you know, even acknowledging the limitations of the data, um, we thought that the trends were, were quite telling. And so we sought to provide recommendations that were clear but also provided programs with some flexibility in their interpretation. Um, and then in the narrative text, we tried to provide information um, to help guide clinicians and programs as to circumstances in which intermittent therapy may or may not be a good option, at least from an efficacy uh, point of view. You know, and I think a final point is that um, the committee uh, definitely discussed and did appreciate that there are many programs that have historically good outcomes with intermittent therapy and really underscores the importance of, of getting that information out there and, and understanding, um, you know, program performance. Yeah, I, I, I have to say that that was one of the things that really hit me is, um, about all of this, it's, it's, it, we, we need to publish our data so that they're actually included in these kind of systematic reviews. So, um, but Dave Ashkin, you know, I, I'm going to pull you into this because I know that this is a, a topic that you've been, you know, very uh, thoughtful on and engaged in. And um, any, any additional thoughts from you? Well, I, you know, I think it's, you know, I think the discussion is very, very important. And, and to me, what I think all the data really points to is the importance of what Payam said earlier when he was talking about, um, you know, the idea of conditional. And, and he said that, you know, when you look at conditional recommendations, it's really about taking a lot into consideration and making the best choices, understanding the pitfalls of your, your, your choices, meaning in certain populations, those that may be smear positive, those have cavities that you may not want to go to intermittent, but taking into the consideration the patient, the intervention, you know, everything, you know, what is best for not only, you know, your patient, but also for the program. And you're right, uh, Lisa, I totally agree with you. I mean, what we really lack, is, it's, it's really sad, is a lot more very, very good data uh, to, you know, make, quote, unquote, strong recommendations. But based on what we have. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, first of all, again and again, an excellent, excellent job. But I think for us as clinicians, for us as program managers, I think it's going to become very, very important to make decisions, you know, based on the individual patient, based on the resources that we have, and making sure, obviously, that we keep an eye on what's going on. I think ultimately it becomes very, very important that we as programs, you know, continue to monitor our success, our weaknesses, and um, be able to understand early on, you know, one of the statements that is made over and over again that if you have somebody who's on intermittent therapy, if they're missing doses, it becomes important to recognize that early and obviously switch them on to a regimen that guarantees the highest chance of success, meaning potentially taking them off intermittency. But I, I think the messages are that, you know, if you have the options, you know, obviously daily is better, uh, at least when it comes to intermittency. and. Uh, Again, uh, when you have the options, you know, obviously things like starting antiretrovirals is better, and, and that, I think, is made clear by this document. All right. Well, we have just a, f a few more minutes. Um, Dave, I know you've been scanning all the different chat questions, again, that we're going to forward on to the second webinar group, but you had one in particular you wanted to, to pull yeah, you know, up. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting question because, you know, one of the things being brought up over and over again is, you know, that you know, if you, if you look at one of the re rationale, at least that, you know, for why not, you, you may not want to use biweekly therapy is with the concept that if you miss one dose, then you're really only giving it once a week. And studies have shown that once a week, at least with INH and rifapentine in the continuation phase, failed. And, um, so, uh, uh, you know, Charlie Crane was asking if somebody could maybe 
you summarize the results of that study and, you know, why they think maybe uh, once a week uh, therapy fails and why it becomes important to be very careful with intermittent therapy. And I was maybe wondering maybe if, uh, if Dick or Andy, I know Andy you were involved in the study, would like to maybe comment on that. Um, well, I'll let Andy comment on the rifapentine study, but I because he's much more familiar than I. Uh, but I uh, definitely know there were some older studies where they tried once weekly INH rif rifampin, and you know results were very poor, and that approach was abandoned quickly. Uh, not only was it very poor, but also there was a higher rate of serious adverse events. The so-called hypersensitivity reactions with rifampin occurred with people on once-a-week therapy. Uh, so, you know, there's not only poor efficacy of treatment when you fall to once a week, but there, you actually substantially increase the risk of adverse events. In our rifapentine study, which was uh, implemented about, begun about 20 years ago, uh, to deal with adverse events first, we did not see an elevated rate of uh, hypersensitivity reactions or other adverse events, but uh, 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 but we were not using high doses. Uh, we were using a 600 milligram dose, which is less even than the 3HP regimen for LTBI uses. Uh, with regard to uh, your comment, Dave, that uh, once weekly failed, it it failed to demonstrate equivalent outcomes with, uh, with twice-weekly therapy, um, it was a little bit weaker. I think the conclusions that the panel drew from the multiple reviews that uh, uh, Professor Menzies presented uh, is that uh, fewer doses is a little bit weaker than, than more, and the binary thinking of it works or it doesn't, into which we've fallen for some years, doesn't really do good, uh, do, do justice to the evidence, which is uh, rather more quantitative and graded. Uh, Andy, and, and I stand corrected. You're exactly right. I didn't mean to mean fail. I, 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 no, no. <laughs> oh, no, I, I appreciate no, no. that. Let me, I, I let just, me ask I, it's, it's, because... It gets back to the question of wording and the words we use. You are so, so right, and I, I appreciate that over and over again. But let me ask this question, because it's being asked, and I think Pete Davidson really phrased it the best. And, and this is what the, the programs are asking. If, if a TV program doesn't have the staffing or the capacity to provide daily dosing throughout the regimen, do, do the panelists feel that intermittent therapy is acceptable? And uh, you know, um, one of the big issues that I think that that some people feel that capacity of our health departments, especially future capacity, may not have been, at least to the reader, some readers, may not have been taken into account uh, enough uh, when these guidelines were written. Any comments on that? Well, um, I, this is Payam. I can, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond to it by referring uh, everyone back to the document. The, the full text document very clearly states that the preferred regimen, and notice the word preferred, is a daily regimen. Um, and the effectiveness of the daily regimen has been shown uh, through the analyses today and in the document as having the highest, um, highest effectiveness of all of them. Now, we note, though, that alternative regimens may be acceptable in certain public health situations. Um, and those, it's under that context that we talk about the, the, thri the thrice weekly, twice weekly, and once weekly um, uh, regimens. Um, in general, we we feel that the data um, show um, with uh, consistency that a daily intensive phase is um, preferred, and that anything less than daily in the intensive phase is generally not preferred. Um, and then from there on, uh, it's almost uh, frankly stepwise. You know, we say thrice weekly is the next best, uh, if you will, um, followed by twice weekly if you don't have the infrastructure or for whatever reason you can't do thrice weekly. Um, and, and it follows down to about once weekly for which we, um, con con you know, c contrary to the 2003 guidelines, actually um, suggest it not be used. So it has already in there the, the stepwise um, uh, interpretation as it relates to public health infrastructure and, and local situations. 
Uh, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. The uh, in in study twenty two, uh, to which I w w alluded earlier, the relapse rate, the, the 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 failure and relapse rate in the twice weekly arm was about uh, five and a half percent. Uh, in most of the published trials where DOT is used with daily therapy, it appears you can usually get the relapse rates uh, uh, certainly below 2% and often below 1%. Uh, from a patient perspective, I think a, a, a 1 in 100 risk of an adverse outcome is highly preferable to a 1 in 20 risk. Uh, from a program perspective, uh, th there are challenges with regards to cost and infrastructure. And again, I don't think our, our choice is simply binary. There are, are creative solutions, cr creative compromises that we have only begun to think about. Uh, and uh, I'll just suggest one of them, which could be uh, a regimen in which patients are given twice weekly DOT and three times a week they receive self-administered therapy. That's an untested regimen, but, uh, but one that would address a lot of the program concern about costs and provide patients the opportunity to receive uh, uh, stronger rather than weaker therapy. Great. Th that, of course, is not something that this guideline addresses in any way, but it points out that we have potential to investigate many ways to address the findings other than and these recommendations uh, other than saying simply it costs too much we can't do it thank you both of you and well, all of you for chiming in on that I know that this is really an area where people at least we've had a small chance to hear um, directly from the folks involved in writing this to and I know particularly this topic is something that there's a lot of a lot more discussion to come and I just wanted to remind folks, I know I let things go a little over because I do really think it's important that folks hear from, from you all, especially on the topic of intermittency. Um, but join us for the second webinar. Um, the date uh, and speakers have yet to be determined, but they'll, they'll uh, come up and submit any of the questions that you have to the email that you see on the screen uh, for ideas that you want them to address during it. And, um, since we're running over, I, I wanted to say a, a really big thank you. Thank you to everyone who was you know, involved in the development of these guidelines and on the writing particularly thank you to the faculty who joined um, on this webinar to present it and share it with all of us, um, and Dave, my co-chair over there. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, thank you all for joining us here, and stay tuned for the second webinar in the series. Bye-bye. This is Andy. I'd just like to thank all of the folks who worked on the guidelines and the staff at the and, and uh, leaders at the RTMCC who helped make this webinar possible. CDC is quite grateful.